Hawaii. I'm Wendy Lowe, and I'm your new tower friend as we journey to take your health path. We are coming to you live from my home office in Makiki and from downtown Honolulu from the studios of Think Tech Hawaii. Today, our topic of discussion will be on health on the front line. It's vital to maintain your physical and mental health today more than ever. What I would like you to take away from today's discussion is the idea that living a life which is healthy both physically and mentally allows you to really live your life. Today we are very honored to welcome a dear friend, Moira Cameron, who in 2007, after serving for 22 years in the British Army, became the first, mind you, the first woman to be appointed as a human warder or beef eater at the Tower of London. The beef eaters are the guardians of the tower and they guard the palace for Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. Aloha Moira and welcome to Hawaii. Aloha. Aloha. Please share a little bit about yourself so our audience can get to hear your beautiful accent and get to know you. Oh, well, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me, Wendy. This is really exciting. It's a bit, just to just to remind everybody, though, that it is it's one o'clock in the morning here in London. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so yes, uh, my name is Moira. I was uh, born and brought up in the west coast of Scotland, and um, it's an area that is very quiet, very rural. There's not much really not much in the way of work it's very tourist orientated and I really I really needed to get away from the area and, and my mother I was a bit of a wild child and my mother <laughs> very she very um strongly uh, supported me in this uh, wow. she used a bit of reverse psychology when I said I wanted to join the army and the reason I wanted to join was because my brother had been in the army and wow. every time he came back he just there was just something about him he had this self-confidence he had his bearing he stood properly he had wow. and everything was different about him and he also wow. had money money in his pocket which was always something else <laughs> that's, that, that, that's a good persuasion that is but a definite good persuasion the stance the standing up straight the discipline that's all that's all wonderful but just tell us a little bit more about the beautiful sights and what was it like growing up in Scotland? Um, Scotland is, it's absolutely beautiful. There is no two ways about it. When it's sunny, there can probably be very few places on earth that will ever rival it. Especially when I was brought up, I, I lived halfway up a hill. So we looked over a loch and across the other side of the, the hills. And it was just very, very beautiful. But when it was cold and it was winter, it was wet and miserable. So, you know, you had to, uh, yeah, you, you really had the, the polar opposites. You had lovely wow. summers. I know, I know we have a beautiful picture of your, there you go. That yeah. beautiful sunset you love so well. And as you were growing up, that's what you were surrounded by. Yeah, that's it. That's, that's, from, that's from my bedroom window, yeah. Wow, how gorgeous, just like Hawaii. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us a little bit more about your family is it just you and your brother uh there's my brother he's five years older than me and then there's me and then my mum and dad they split up uh but my uh, that's my brother and me there uh, wow uh, look at that picture as soon as i could reach the piano i was playing it um whether it was music or not was i thought it was a symphony my mother wasn't too keen on it but wow. <laughs> But then my father, he um, he had another he had another daughter, my sister, mm -hmm. and she has got uh, she's got two boys. So yeah, so I've got two nephews. Wow. But my family, my cousins, and I were all quite close. Wow, yeah. and that's so important. Yeah, very go, much. Do you go back to Scotland to visit? I go back about uh, normally twice a year. Normally, wow. um, yeah. But they come down here as well because they love it. And my nephews were down last year and they just, it was the first time in London. Really? Of was, yes, first time in London. And it was the first time my sister had been to London. She's been down to the South before, but not actually yeah, London. I beat her. You beat her, <laughs> yeah. You stayed here twice. <laughs> oh, wow, that's yeah, amazing. It was fabulous. 
Wow. And so you had a beautiful childhood growing up in Scotland. So again, what made you decide to join the army, Moira? Just because of my brother, really. And it was. And I knew that I had to get away. There, there wasn't going to be the work for me there. Um, you know, I just, I, my, I needed to stretch my wings a little bit more. And because he had such a, you know, this bearing and he just, he just looked different. I just wanted a bit of it. So I thought, well, I can always try it. And if it doesn't work out, then it doesn't work out. So my wow. mother gave me three years. In fact, she didn't even give me three years. She said I wouldn't finish my training, that I wouldn't be able to stand the discipline. <laughs> wow. So, wow. Yeah. So you're a competitive sort, just like I am. And mm. so you needed not to just do it for yourself. I'm sure you wanted to tell mom, I can do this. You watch. I'll do it. Yeah. And not only did you do it, but you served for 22 years, I believe. I did. Okay. And then you were up for a position. And uh, that would be the bee feeder position. And I just want you to tell us what made you want to become a bee feeder slash human warder? Um, well, it, it was actually a bit of a, it was just one of these things that just happened. An opportunity came along. Uh, that's me with my military uniform beside my foot, the chief and the jailer at the time. Um, but yeah, it was, I'd retrained as a plumber and electrician. So I was going to go home to Scotland to work. And I just happened to be, it was about a year before I left the army. And I looked at a military magazine one day and it had a picture of a beef eater on it. And I went, oh, that looks quite interesting. Opened it up and it said <laughs> it wasn't just a job for the boys. So Aww. now I'd already known that it was a former military position. You've got to do the 22 years. Right. You've got to have your long service and good conduct medal, and you've got to have your royal warrant, which just means we were sergeant majors. Um, and it's that's the equivalent throughout the three services. And I thought, I'm going to phone these guys up. I've never been posted in London, had never served in London at all, always wanted to. Wow. And I phoned up and I was on the phone for about half an hour with the, the HR manager. So, uh, yeah, it was really interesting. Very interesting. Wow. So now you see an ad <laughs> that they're opening up the position of a human warder and women can apply as well, as long as you meet the criteria. And I yep. believe it's 22 con consecutive years of service mm -hmm. to the British Army and a whole lot of other mental attributes and physical attributes, which you, you nailed. And then, so you say, I can do this. And then you apply. And then what, how did you get notified? I mean, how did this, does this all work? Well, I was interviewed for the position in the, I think it was the early December, late November, early December, 2006. Mm -hmm. And I was at home on Christmas leave in Scotland. And I had a phone call basically saying, that if I was still interested, that they wanted to offer me the position. Um, so yeah, but because it was the first one, yes. I was going to be the first female, it was, uh, I had to keep it all quiet and secret. <laughs> I wasn't allowed to tell MD apart from my family. So, uh, so, uh, so yeah. they're setting you up for failure at that point because <laughs> how can a woman, a wahini, you give her the biggest secret of her life and you, but you, you got the position, but shh, no one needs to know. <laughs> Can you Nobody keep that can secret? Tell. And if you don't, then you don't get the title, right? But <laughs> that was the, probably I, the harder part than the 20 was, weeks of service. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> wow. Wow. That's, that's amazing. That's amazing. And so now you say, yes, I would surely love to take the position. Oh, yes. Yes, definitely. Trying to keep wow. very cool about it. You say, oh, yes, I'd love to. Um, wow. But as soon as I came off the phone, I was bouncing all over the place. And there, wow. was, there was only my brother's dog in the house at the time and it thought it was going for a walk. So it started bouncing too. <laughs> but, <laughs> but yeah, it was oh. Oh, what a phenomenal feeling. Absolutely. A, yes, yes. That is, that's a feat, an accomplishment that I'm so, I'm so proud that I even get to know you and oh, bless you. Thank share you. this journey with you. And I feel so excited, like I'm even part of it because... I kind of met you at that time, a few years after, but just, yeah, I just feel so, I feel the excitement and the love. 
And then when you went to work as a, as a bee feeder, what did you do and where did you work at? Well, the first thing that you have to do is we, every single person that comes here as a, as a bee feeder, they have to spend time in, you know, you don't go into your uniform straight away. So you're, you know, you're just in your, your suit or whatever. And I normally it's about a couple of, a couple of weeks, but because they wanted to control the press uh, release, et cetera, they, um, they basically, they said, you know, we're not going to, we're not going to put you into uniform until September. August is a very quiet month is the media is concerned. So, uh, yeah, so I was in September, I, I finally went into uniform. And by that time, I was really ready for it. That's, that's it there. And that lovely wow. chap that's facing us with the stripy tie and the glasses. Uh -huh. he, he works for CNN International. He was a lovely chap. Wow. And so that was yeah. that one of your first media? Um, I, no, because when I'd, when I'd been introduced when it, in the January of 2007, I'd also mm -hmm. been introduced as uh, unveiled to the, <laughs> to the press. So that was... I had no comprehension how big this thing was, Wendy. Oh. I had none, uh, no idea whatsoever. <laughs> really, Moira? I mean, the history of the tower is like, what, 700 plus years of yeah. all male dominated, yeah. right? Bee feeders. And now you come along after all that history, and that's historical. Yeah. That's news breaking. Yeah, definitely. And um, to be the first female bee feeder in the Tower of London. Um, that's all I got to say to people. And they're like, wow, you know her? I'm like, <laughs> oh, that's lovely. <laughs> okay. And so now, now you get unveiled and go through all the interviews and now you earn the rights of your uniform. Yes. Okay. So when you get put into the uniform now, what, what is your main job as a bee feeder? We are still classed as the guardians of the tower. So we, we guard the towers. We look after the people, we look after our visitors that come every day. Um, we also, because we live here at the tower as well, you know, there's 46 families that live inside the tower grounds and the 37 beef eaters, we, we all live here. So it's a living palace. So you have to make sure that people don't go into places they're not meant to be going. So it's, uh, yeah, so we're and still guardians. Tower. And then people, you know, audience, um, I don't know if you understand, this tower is a, is a palace, it's, it's massive. And you walk there and the most guests they go through the gate, they give their ticket, and then they cross over a moat. Is it still called a moat? Still called the moat, even though it's grass. <laughs> yeah, it's a moat. And uh, it's like, is it like 45 feet or what's the distance of the moat? 110 wide. 110 wide, you're crossing over, going into the palace or the Tower of London. And then there's a wall. And then there, your, your, your living quarters, what is the depth of the wall to the front of your door? Uh, that's about 35 feet. Okay, so in the wall of the Tower of London is where all these amazing beef eaters reside. And you're saying what? Because when you walk into the tower, it's tower, it's cathedral, it, it's museums, it's everything as a, a tower would be. So they have built their living quarters in the wall of the tower. And that's where Moida resides. And you're thinking, oh my gosh. But let me tell you, it's very updated, upscale. I mean, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful home that Moina lives in and, and calls her home for the last, what, 13 years or? 13 years now, yes. 13 years. And just phenomenal because she, she might have a day off and go out in, into town. But when all the guests are leaving, all the, the visitors are leaving, she's coming home from a day out in the, in the town. And it's so cool because that's her home. People are leaving and she's going home. I just think that's phenomenal. Yeah, it's quite cool. Of course, you know, the big talking point is the bathroom window. Oh, I talk about it all the time. My bathroom window is about, you open a little louver door, don't you? And you look eight feet to an arrow slit. And then that's it. That's the bathroom window. So that is the big talking point. Everybody has to look at that when they come Everybody in. has to go to that bathroom because when you open the door, it's a regular toilet, but behind the toilet, there's a, a, a door, a cabinet, and like she says, is that, I believe, where the archers would sat would have sat in time of battle? Yes. Well, it the, the wouldn't be that small. It would be, it would be a ledge. It's only because it's been built up. 
No, oh. the, the wall would be that thick, but it would be more of a, a little, like a kind of a, a tunnel down to it. So. Right. And so people use that now for storage or because it's so cool and the stone keeps everything so cool. Moira, what would they also store in there? Oh, it's really good for keeping the wine cold. <laughs> I didn't know if I could say that. So I said toilet paper. But yeah, it's become <laughs> amazing wine storage cooler, wine cellar, right? Built into the wall of the tower. It's beyond creative of what they've done there. And it's a beautiful home, which I, I've visited a few times. Yeah. Going there. You know, so Moira, every day you go outside your door, you can't say I'm late for work because there's no traffic when you exit your door and you're right there at work. So <laughs> no. no real reason for you to be work, I mean, to be late at work. But I know you, um, on an average day, how many visitors come to visit the Tower of London? Excuse me, we, we normally average annually about 3 million. Whoa. Yeah, so our busiest weekend is Easter. Wow. Good Friday, and that's our, I think our record then was sixteen thousand and one in one day. So it's you know it's crazy. It is crazy, yeah. but wow. you've, you, it's lovely because the people, especially if it's good weather, because people just want to be there, and you get good giggles and chats, and you're telling kids stories, and it's fabulous. It's really great fabulous. photo opportunities everywhere yeah. you turn. I mean, just taking a picture with Moira. The first bee feeder in the Tower of London. That's already an a craze, uh, a, a photo opportunity, and then all the different sites and everything about oh. walking back into history in the Tower is just so. When you guys go to London, it is a must see, and you mm -hmm. actually feel like you step back into history, and you can just feel the presence of what actually happened back in all those years of history. Yeah, it's phenomenal. And Moira, that you get to walk it and breathe it and live it. Wow. I know. <laughs> How fortunate am I? Yes, you're so blessed. But now we want to bring it up to date. And I just have to ask you this question. You know, how has COVID-19 affected the visitor count at the Tower of London? Or is it even open at all? Right. We closed on the 20th of March. Mm -hmm. and, um, and we basically became a fortress again. Uh, there was we were the only people who were in the tower so um and we were self-isolating as we as well as much as we could do because we still had to carry out duties we still had to carry out our um security duties people were still having to go out to get provisions and come back in and things like that so it was very very strange it felt a bit like it just felt like our, like it was christmas day because it's exactly what we would do on christmas day but it was the middle of summer. Well, it was very hot here. Felt like the middle of summer. Um, and it was, you know, it was every day and it, then it started to become very weird. We then, when things started relaxing slightly, uh, we started looking at when we were going to reopen. And because it's a charity that runs the tower and uh, four, the, four other palaces in London, one in Northern Ireland, uh, we have to keep running we have to keep going because they were still paying us you know this was the government were paying people who were on furlough right um, but it was just it was sucking money out of the charity like nothing on earth wow. so we had to open up as quick as we could mm -hmm. but of course it had to maintain safety so we are now open we opened again on friday this past uh, friday yeah friday we opened again wow Moira, yeah. for those months you were down yeah yeah wow. And I, I think most of us worked, we worked kind of half and half because we didn't need everybody on shift at one time. Mm -hmm. And we had, um, we opened on Friday. We have, um, you book tickets online, preferably. Uh, mm -hmm. You can turn up, but we have got a maximum of 1,000 people a day. No more. Wow. One what way a in. Difference. Yeah, it's a big, what big a difference. difference. But for people coming in, you know, because there's only a thousand people a day, it's like having a private tour. Yes. You know, they, you, you're seeing people laughing their heads off because they're going into the crown jewels twice, maybe yeah, three they're times. Not having to wait in line. Yeah, they don't have no lines, nothing. It's like private tours. Wow. Um, and because we've got a one way route, 
they, um, they, they get really close to the Queen's House now, which is the, one of the original Tudor buildings in the, in the City of London. Um, we get really close to it now, so that is really good news. Um, but obviously we can't have everything open, um, but it's good, it's lovely, and people are just, they're just, you're getting lots of people, locals, who don't want to come during the summer, because right. it's too crowded. Mm -hmm. They're coming now. Wow. That's, that's that's fabulous for them. Yeah, it's fantastic. Yes. Yes, and we're going to do one more better. We're going to say, okay, world, the Tower in L of London is now open. It's open. Online. You be the first thousand and you're in. Yes. All right, because they're going to let only a thousand in per day. But when you're in the area, you got to see the Tower of London. It is oh, yeah. And the crown jewels mm -hmm. and all the chivalry and armor of, of their past. Mm -hmm. It is phenomenal. And I just yeah. recommend everyone to have a stop by and be the first thousand of the day and you get to see there. And then if you're, when you're looking out carefully, you're going to see Moira and you're going to just say, Aloha Moira, because <laughs> she has some <laughs> great Hawaiian roots with her. So <laughs> now we move further. And let me ask you, I know it's just, a, it's a highlight every day for you, but what are the high points of being a beef eater, Moira? It is the people. For me, it's the people. There's no two ways about it. You get, um, and that's everybody from little kids who just are, you know, they're running about going mad and then of course they'll see you and they'll go, oh, and you speak to them and they go all shy or they start chatting and they start asking these questions. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's just fascinating. People are wow. just fascinating. People, people are fascinating. Mm -hmm. And then you're, you have the, 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 your duty is to talk to them and make them feel welcome and get mm -hmm. to know them and then let them open their hearts and minds so they can enjoy the experience of the Tower of London. So yeah. you're you're the perfect person for this opportunity, for this position. Thank but I, you. Know, I also know that there was one really, um, you got a letter. I think you got a letter from our governor. And um, tell us, I mean, when you shared that with me, you, I just thought, oh, well, another letter. Oh, I got up here somewhere. So what were your thoughts when you got a letter from our governor, Linda Lingle? And what did it say there? When I received the letter, and of course it had her address on the back, and I, and I went, oh, that's really kind. As a letter of, you know, congratulations coming from a, a female governor in, Hawaii, in, in America. That is absolutely wonderful. And I opened it up and... And I started reading it and it was many congratulations. And then she's, and then it said that we would love to invite you to Hawaii to take part in a, an international conference. And I just couldn't speak. I just kind of went, ah, 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 ah. and there we are. So it was so funny. In Hawaii. <laughs> oh girl, you with your lay and all. Mm -hmm. I know. Oh wow, that was you just know, so fabulous. I, I just thought that was a run of you know your your everyday repertoire. I get invited to London, I get invited to Hawaii, I get invited all over the world. I just thought that was, but you actually got excited about coming to Hawaii and oh, being yeah. the governor and all the women of Hawaii. I mean, I have the the book right here. So this is the book. Oh, it is. Okay. So the governor Linda Lingo had international. Women's Leadership Conference, and this was the fifth annual that Moira was to appear at. She was being summoned by our governor in, to speak in 2008, and that's when I met Moira. <laughs> right? So I, so you would say still to today that would be one of your highlights. Of oh, most leader. definitely, most definitely, and I love it when Hawaiians come to the tower because you can hear the accent a little bit, and I can I can know it now, and I'm sitting. Oh, where are you from? Oh, the US. And I said, Whereabouts? Oh, we come from Hawaii. And I went, Oh, aloha. And they went, I said, Oh, I've been in the big island. I've stayed in Oahu. And, <laughs> and then, as you know, as, it's just I lovely for them as well. You're Ohana right there. As soon as you say that, you're Ohana. And so that's oh. what they need to hear from you. So now, when, you, when, you, when you're at work, I know you have one of those most amazing uniforms ever. Can you just share with us a few details of the most iconic uniform that you adorn daily? Well, the blue and red uniform is, when people come into the tower, they get a little bit, oh, where's your red and gold uniform? Because they always associate the state uniform, which is on the, 
the beef eater gin bottle that one there yeah. they, they think we wear that all the time and it's just so uncomfortable <laughs> and very very warm so yes yeah, so we wear blue one the working uniform is the your working one. Uniform, yeah. And Eric, if you could put that photo back up of the beef eaters, and uh, Moina, just give us a few details about the poundage or what you are wearing there. Well, what we've got on our height on our heads is the the Tudor bonnet. So that's a black velvet bonnet, and it's got red, white, and blue ribbon around it to symbolise the red, white, and blue of our flag. And the white ruff is very Tudor, so that's a Tudor uniform, and it's a you see the red where the um on our on our chests mm -hmm. we have e r and there's a roman numerals too and that is uh, elizabeth regina secundi which it means queen elizabeth ii wow and then we've got this the floral symbols of the uh, of the countries as well just below it it's very difficult to see so um, but the, the, the skirt bit of it, skirt bit of it, I can say it's a skirt. Men wear skirts, uh, being Scottish as well. Um, what it is for is because it's, it's split into four. And that was basically so that you could get onto a horse. That's basically what it was. Wow. And then we've got the breeches and our red tights. Um, and about how much does it weigh? Does it weigh a lot? It's incredibly heavy. Mm -hmm. really really heavy it's very thick and all the gold braid is very heavy as well so in the middle of summer nobody yeah. wants to be in it but There's it's a lot of wear them on special occasions right yeah it's, very it's, it's special so, occasions it's so iconic it's amazingly beautiful yeah. Okay, so now we got to move on because we're going to run out of time. I know. I know there's a very important event that takes place at the Tower of London where the Tower of London is adorned with thousands and thousands of handmade poppies. And I was there one year and I saw it. Please share with us a few highlights of this monumentous occasion of the poppies. The poppies was a commemoration of the beginning of the First World War. Um, as you use poppies as well as your, as your memorial symbol for, for people who have died. And we had, for, there was a poppy, a handmade ceramic poppy each for each person, each person who had been killed during the First World War, and that was 888,246 handmade poppies. Wow. So it was, it was beautiful, but it was, wow. You can understand why we were, the country was in mourning for three years. Right. Stunning, absolutely beautiful. And even now, people still come now and ask where the poppies are. I know it's oh, yeah. a, that was it's such a beautiful time to be oh, there. Oh, stunning! It. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to ask. So may I ask you, who is your boss? My boss <laughs> is Her Majesty the Queen. Woohoo! Not many people can say that. <laughs> there they are, with the poppies in the mold. Yes. Yeah. What a beautiful yeah. shot, Moira! How beautiful is that? Well. Long live the queen. Yes, most Ooh. definitely. Yes. So as a human warder, you have many opportunities to meet many dignitaries from around the world, Moida, um, and very many, many treasured visitors to the Tower of London. Please share with us a few of the VIPs that you have greeted in your past 13 years. Well, I was very honored to welcome Governor Linda Lingle <laughs> and her family. They came over. They would be, they'd been uh, doing some business um in germany i think it was and then they came to london so she came in and it was just lovely to be able to you know say welcome to my home uh yeah. so that was lovely and then of course we met um we met first lady michelle obama as well well that's right you were there fabulous it was, there. yes she's so wow. tall yes very tall <laughs> yes. beautiful lady and I know there's one more slide of just uh, uh, a dear friend of mine, and, and there you are in Hawaii again. Hey. Yes, and that is a lovely experience. I was a commissioner for the status of women for under Governor Linda Lingo, and uh, my opportunity was that I get to meet and greet all our guests. And we became friends, lifelong friends, and yeah. we went to the North Shore, and we went surfing together, and um, just had a good time in our beautiful state, and I was so blessed to be able to share it with you, right? So Mahalo for that. running short, but I know, um, I know about one final phrase our audience can use as a reminder to themselves. 
And what would that be for you, Moira? Well, there's lots of things that went through my mind, um, but it's, you should never accept disrespect from anybody, mm -hmm. especially yourself. Exactly. Especially that, yourself. You see so true. many people doing it. And right. as, when people, when I hear people putting themselves down, even in a joke, I say to them, there's plenty of people in this world that will do that for you. Don't you do it yourself. <laughs> so, yeah. Amen. Yeah. That is absolutely right. Yeah. Um, Waida, you gotta love yourself. Up right now, and I just can go on and on and on with you. And I just so appreciate you and all that you've done for your country, and how you represent the Tower of London superbly. And when you were chosen, they chose the right one. And so, oh, God thank bless you. you. And God bless the Queen of England. And just continue doing the best job that you are chosen to do. And we want to just say mahalo to you and aloha from Papa'i. And we will see you soon. You take care and thank you so much, everybody. Just wanted to say, I've got my Mililani High Trojans. Yeah, there <laughs> you go, her hoodie, her Mililani hoodie. The Mililani hoodie. The students really looked after her and she went to visit with them and they yeah. so loved you. And they're all nice young men and women now. And oh, so oh, yeah. we're going to send this to them and they're going to appreciate that. So mahalo and aloha to you, Moira. We love you and we cherish all that you are. Aloha. Mahalo. Aloha.